Hi, and uh, welcome to module number 44. Recall that we're discussing the sparse signal processing material, and we looked at wavelets. Wavelets led to uh, multi-resolution approximation. And if you think about it, wavelets are extending other tools that for different types of signals can provide us with sparsity, meaning that it might be feasible to represent some types of signals in a sparse way that uh, with respect to some uh, frame or basis, most of the coefficients are going to be small and just a few of them are gonna be significant. And if we keep only, only the larger coefficients and throw away the rest, that'll give a pretty good uh, approximation to the signal, but with uh, much lower complexity than before. And by complexity, I mean here information complexity instead of computational complexity. And this idea that there are signals that can be sparsified this idea leads to sparse signal acquisition and more generally to an area that's been called compressed or compressive sensing over the last 10, 15 years or so. So let's recall where we were several, several weeks ago. This is the traditional way how uh, sensing is performed in traditional digital signal processing or DSP applications. And the, the key idea is sampling above the Nyquist rate. And the Nyquist rate is two times the highest frequency of the signal. So we have uh, a signal X, we take N samples, we compress it, meaning that we compute random projections uh, of X or of the N samples of X with respect to these uh, different uh, basis vectors. And only K of these coefficients are gonna be large. K is much smaller than N. Uh, we're going to throw away the rest. We're gonna transmit uh, and or store the K largest coefficients at the encoder. And on the receiver side, all we do, we take those K numbers and we form uh, a linear combination of the K corresponding vectors. So we do a lot of work. We calculate uh, this entire representation, all the coefficients only to throw away the large majority, at least 90% of the coefficients. Another comment is that this traditional DSP system is somewhat asymmetric where there's a lot of computation at the sensor, the encoder side, which is often battery operated for example, a phone, whereas the decoder side, you're often plugged into the wall. You often have a lot of energy. So it's kind of mismatched. So the capabilities that we have in some systems, and this really uh, is creating a brick wall to performance in some modern acquisition systems. And compressed sensing looks at the Sh Shannon or Nyquist sampling theorem, and it says that we need to sample above two times the highest analog frequency in the signal. And it's a worst case bound for all the band limited signals. But oftentimes we, we know more than that. This, this bound may be somewhat pessimistic for some classes of band limited signals. And that's because we don't exploit signal sparsity or signal compressibility. And what we'd like to do is to directly sense compressible information. Compressed sensing uh, comes out of the observation that sparse signals can be recovered from a small number of non-adaptive linear measurements. Candace and Donahoe were some of the early innovators and there's been a lot of activity again over the last 10, 15 years. So the idea is as follows. We, we take X and we project it onto this, these random noise basis vectors. And in these random noise basis vectors, the, the data is not sparse at all. Nonetheless, we have M of those, M measurements, where M is, um, proportional to k log n over k. And that number is much, much less than n. For example, a typical problem, uh, n might be a million pixels, k might be 10,000 large wavelet coefficients, and m might be 50,000 measurements. Now, the main idea here is that these white noise vectors, these random vectors are universally incoherent, meaning that statistically they're orthogonal with anything that you want, at least on average. And because of that, a mild oversampling in, on, in analog gives you enough information to later be able to reconstruct the signal. And so the encoding size is relatively simple, whereas earlier we had a lot of computation here, as long as we can perform M of these measurements, M of these random projections in analog hardware, we're all set. 
And the receiver side here, the decoder is more complicated. The reconstruction algorithm needs to be aware of the structure in which we happen to be sparse. And it looks for uh, sparse explanations to our measurements, which are again with respect to this white noise basis vector. And to do so, optimization routines are used and typically their computation is quite intense. But this is, this is not a problem because again, the decoder side of, oftentimes you're less limited computationally. So this is again a, an asymmetric system with more computation at the receiver, but it might be better matched in many systems. So let's talk a bit about compressed sensing encoding and then compressed sensing decoding, but there's these themes are going to be revisited in much more detail in future modules. So on the encoder side, we're replacing samples by a more general encoder based on a small number of linear projections. So the signal X can be represented by a column vector. It's of length N and you have K large coefficients, the, the blue boxes. And, and most, of the co most of the coefficients are gonna be small, close to zero. And each of the measurements is gonna be an inner product of a row vector in the phi matrix multiplied by that column vector. And a row multiplied by a column vector is a scalar. And we stack together multiple rows one underneath another in this matrix phi and the matrix vector product phi times x gives us the, the, the vector of measurements y. Overall, once again, we have m measurements. m is a proportional to k log n, which is much less than n. Another important thing to remember is that this is not any matrix phi, but these are random projections, projections with respect to a white noise uh, matrix. And that, that provides the property that with high probability, uh, these measurements are going to be universal with respect to any compressible or sparse signal class. So later, when you know what class of, uh, what class of signals you're dealing with, you'll be able uh, to derive uh, a basis in which you believe that the signal is going to be sparse, and you'll use that information in the reconstruction. So the compressed sensing decoder, again, details later, proceeds as follows. We have y equals phi x. This is just a beginning to this problem. Later, we'll also be adding measurement noise. And the goal is, given y, to find x. But the problem is that this is an ill-posed inver inverse problem. We have far more unknowns than measurements. So the decoding approach proceeds as follows. We search over the subspace of explanations to measurements, and we find the most likely explanation. Now recall, x is not any x, x is a sparse x. So although the number of total unknowns in x is, is typically gonna be significantly larger than the number of measurements in y, the number of non-zeros in x is gonna be quite a bit smaller than the number of measurements in y. So we search over all the possible explanations, all the possible sparse explanations to measurements, we find the most likely one in quotation marks because there can be different probabilistic measures or geometrical measures of likelihood. And the universality that I mentioned earlier that any structure that we could be sparse in can be incorporated, that universality is accounted for during the optimization routine. Candace and Donahoe and other authors showed that a linear program decoding routine uh, again, an L1 optimization, which we've looked at when discussion, discussing the optimization material in this course, uh, requires a relatively small number of samples. Uh, M is approximately K log N over K. And additionally, we've seen in the optimization material that these types of optimization problems are computationally tractable. Uh, at a later time in future modules, we're gonna discuss sparse recovery in greater details. Um, so the hallmarks of compressed sensing are as follows. It really changes the rules of the data acquisition game by exploiting sparsity information to reduce the number of measurements. On the hardware and software side, we have the important property of universality that a small number of random projections can be used for any compressible signal class. We can reuse similar hardware, similar software designs for many different types of sparsity. And this simplifies the design. On the signal processing side, we have what could be referred to as information scalability. Random projections can be thought of as 
sufficient statistics. And when we have more random projections, we have more information and we can perform more complicated statistical inference tasks. So if we have more measurements, we can estimate or decode the signal. And uh, lighter tasks might be recognizing objects there or possibly detection, seeing if something is there or not. And overall, far fewer measurements are gonna be required to perform the lighter statistical inference tasks. These types of ideas are leading a next generation data acquisition schemes. For example, compressed sensing has been used in medical imaging and other technologies. And again, I'm gonna describe some of these in greater detail over the next several modules. So that'll be it for, for today.